Hello and okay. welcome to our PCS Grades weekly webinar. PCS Grades is all about helping military families and their fellow service members move. So whether you're going across town, across the country, or to the other side of the world, PCS Grades is here for you with the resources to support you before, during, and after your move. So our webinars bring the experts to you so you can address your PCS questions and get you the answers that you need. I'm Lizanne Lightfoot. I'm the content editor at PCS Grades. I'm a military spouse and mom of five kids and a published author. And this is my wonderful co-host, Tessa Robinson. Hey, hi, I'm Tessa Robinson. I am a proud guest contributor to PCS Grades blog and also do a lot of other things in the writing space. Um, it's so excited to be back for our weekly webinar and especially with these two guests. They might look familiar because this week we have back by popular demand. We have Brad and Ernie from Charter Transportation. You're going to meet them in just a minute. If this is your first time, you are in for a treat. We had them on a few weeks ago talking about some of the moving process and you guys had such great questions and they were sharing such wonderful tips from inside the moving industry that we thought it was really worth it to have a second conversation to address some of those questions that we did not get around to the first time. So today we are focusing on moving tips and tricks from inside the moving company. Let's go ahead and meet our experts for today. And Ernie, I think the last time you were on, we really encouraged you to have a reality show. I think coming back on our webinar might be your step into reality television. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Ernie, and then Brad will have you pipe in too. Well, thank you guys for having us back. Uh, you know, it's an honor to, to, you know, to be with you all. And, um, you know, it's a privilege just to be able to communicate from, you know, from our side of the, our side of the aisle, you know, so to speak, and to kill some of the, the stress and, and things that we possibly can, you know, throughout the PCS. But I've been in the industry 35 plus years. Um, mostly, most of that tenure has been military moves. I'm a second generation mover. Um, and, you know, I, uh, Tried to get out of the moving business several times in my several times in my younger age, but uh, you know it just kept kept calling me back. And uh, you know my dad's been doing it since 1970, and uh, he's still at it. And so it's just kind of a family thing. And and I've actually love what I do, love interacting with people. Um, and right now, you know, for years, just been love moving the military, my, our military families. Awesome, You're we're amazing. so glad to have you. And Brad, over to you. We're glad you're back as well. Well, thank you for having us back. Um, I have to admit, the first time I was pretty nervous about doing this, but it went off without a hitch and everything. Um, it, it, it was great to be able to see the comments come through on the screen and actually interact with members and then to see how many views the video got after the fact. Um, just made me feel more, um, I don't know, just made me feel better about helping the military community who service their country. So whatever we can do to help, um, we are here to help. Uh, my little disclaimer is no movers ever perfect. So we're not perfect either. Um, so there are issues, but it all comes down to how the company recovers and what they do to make sure that they make things right for the service member. Um, I have been in the industry for 30 years and much like Ernie, uh, my father was in the industry um, for 45 years. So I joined Charter Transportation 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and um, looking forward to helping more and more military members um, have a comfortable PCS. Absolutely. It's such an important mission, and we just really value the insight and the perspective that you lent to our webinar last time, and that's why we invited you back again. So I want to show you guys some shout outs that you're getting from around the country. Again, we've got Fort Leavenworth tuning in. Hey, April. And here is Daniela from Hawaii. Great to see you again. And we've got Jenna in Fort Stewart, Georgia. So if you are watching, we absolutely welcome your comments. We want to see where you're coming from. If you've got orders already, if you have specific questions, you can feel free to share all of that during the webinar. And we encourage it because at the end of the day, we are drawing some winners for a prize. We change it up every week, but this time our prize is three of the Stress Less PCS kits. It's a binder and a checklist that includes all of those colorful moving labels, everything that you need to do to keep your PCS list organized and it even has these colorful door tags 
that you can use to label each room and just improve that communication with the moving company. So we're going to be giving away three of those today. And the way you get entered to win is just leaving comments, leaving questions like you're doing right now. Give a shout out to our guest or ask them something about your upcoming move. So Tessa, let's jump on into this and fire up some questions for our guests. I love it. So I think we should start off with some quick questions from our audience after the previous webinar. So Brad, you already told us that jewelry or small valuables should be hand carried by the family or placed in a suitcase or box that's secured before the movers arrive. But what about larger sentimental items that are too big to hand carry? Right. So what I what I suggest there, and Ernie, you can jump in whenever you want with some real life experiences, but you know, if it's very sentimental and it's small enough to be hand carried or packed in your luggage, yes, take it with you. If it's if it's a bigger type of item or there's multiple smaller items, try to move them all into one central location and make sure that you point them out to the lead packer as well as the driver when he gets there, just so that they can assign the you know the best, most competent uh, crew member to pack those items. Um, it is also extremely important on the on the front end during the coordination and the, the pre-move calls with the customer service coordinator to identify such items. Like maybe there's a, a dollhouse that your great grandpa built and it's been in the family for many of years. Um, if the coordinator understands that and knows that exists and the surveyor sees it, we can do a better job of prepping the crew to say, Hey, you know, maybe, you know, internationally wrap this piece and shrink wrap it before you put pads on it to load it into the trailer. Um, those types of things, the more knowledge that the crew has before they get to the house on those bigger type of items, the more prepared they can be. Um, so that that's the real thing. Consol try to consolidate everything in one area. I know it's hard when you've got three or four packers in your house and they're all in different areas to be concerned about, you know, this sentimental piece here and over here. And if, if they're small enough and can be in one place, um, usually the most competent packer is packing the kitchen, so it might make sense to put him in the kitchen. Um, but just know, because I see a lot of uh, comments about packing, is like, why did they mix items in the boxes? Just prepare for that um, if, if you're going to do that. So that's how what I think about the sentimental items and just being more prepared with those. Ernie, what do you think? Yeah, and just, you know, understand, you know, as, as most of you all know, the stress level that you go through when you're moving, you know, sometimes you forget to do things. I actually uh, years ago had a, the police called on my crew for an accusation of, uh, you know, of, of some stolen goods that she forgot she had put in her suitcase so that they would be, uh, you know, so that, you know, and, and then after the fact, you know, she she remembered, oh, my God, I put them in my suitcase. So sorry. But, you know, it, the stress level that goes, I mean, write yourself a list, make a note, present it to both the crew leader, uh, you know, or the driver. Uh, when I do my pre-call, you know, for myself, that's those are things that I ask. You know, are there any spe special needs that we have to pay attention to? Even you know, start preparing even before we get there. So, uh, those are just some good things to keep in mind because the stress level for some people uh, is pretty high. For sure. And Brad, I like that you mentioned that you could request, you know, maybe a little bit special wrapping for certain items. And we did have a question about shrink wrap. Does one of you want to? answer that authoritatively? Can you request things to be wrapped in a particular way or does that depend on the company? You know, this is a, somewhat of a, a gray area. If you look at the business rules and the tender of service, you know, we're supposed to use industry best practices. And when I say, you know, if, if there's that dollhouse that has been in the family for, I don't know, a hundred years, let's just say, you know, there may be some additional charges to take care of that piece, but, most of the time, and Ernie, you know this, if if the crew is competent enough, they can just figure out a way how to make sure that it gets just padded with regular furniture pads and then maybe just shrink wrapped around that. Um, the the shrink wrap piece is just a more important in the international piece that we'll talk about a little later mm -hmm. down in, in this webinar. But it's industry best practices to protect the household goods is what we're supposed to do. Okay, that makes sense. Now, Ernie, we do have two questions that we are always getting for the movers, so we want to hear your opinion on these. And the first is, should the family tip the movers? What's the industry standard there? And secondly, should we serve lunch to the moving crew? And that has become really confusing lately because the DOD did recently say that families are not required to serve lunch 
And my understanding is that they were just trying to make things more equal and even across the board so that some families wouldn't be doing a five course spread and other families are offering nothing. But we'd really like to hear from you. What's the industry expectation there? So, you know, that's again, that that's a subject that's uh, kind of, you know, each family, each driver, each crew. But uh, it's all it's never an obligation. Uh, obviously, it's always appreciated. Uh, one of the things that I have picked up, especially after I heard that that announcement was in my pre-call move, I do address, uh, you know, my family and I do say, hey, look, I just want to touch on this so that there's no, you know, the guys don't prepare lunch and you guys are planning on doing it. I know it's for some people it may be an uncomfortable subject to touch on, uh, but I mean let's just put it out there. It's a fact of life, right? We need to eat. Everybody's going to eat. We're all together. Uh, most families, you know, that I encounter want to show appreciation by providing lunch. Uh, I will say, stay away from pizza if you don't want your guys napping on the job, right? Because it's kind of heavy. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, stay, uh, you know, get into healthy things if you're going to do it. But I would. Uh, that's something I would communicate with the crew right off the bat. Um, I do it in my pre-call just to kind of, you know, to 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 kill the ugly on the shelf, right? And um, um, mo I can tell you, most of people are, are are like, yeah, we're gonna we plan on covering lunch, you know, whatever it is. Um, but you know, and of course, you know, we're not asking for s cargo and and steak, right? We're just uh, uh, so it's just a communication thing on that point uh, concerning the. Uh, but again, it is. It is uh, appreciated, but it's not an obligation. Ernie, what's your what's your favorite lunch that you've ever been served? Can does one stick out in particular? You know, I've, I, it's been a variety. Uh, as far as the the healthiest, the favorite is you know, um, you know, just uh, I know we a lot of people get a lot of Subway, a lot of Chick Fil A, a lot of things like that. Um, but we've had people go, I mean, cook us lunch. You know, they pop open the barbecue pit and you know put put the you know, in Texas, we like fajitas, right? So everybody does the, you know, the steak strips and the and the chicken. But I mean, again, it's just a matter of of, uh, of what you're. I mean, if it's just a one day a one day crew, one day thing, you know, sometimes it's three or four days that we're there packing and loading these bigger shipments, and so, um, you know, it's we just communicate. But uh, uh, you know, just health things that are, that are healthy, energetic, right? Put put some uh, energy in the afternoon. That makes sense. Absolutely. Well, thank you for clearing that up. And what about tips? So again, that's another area. Tips are um, appreciated, not an obligation. You know, I tell a story. I had, years ago, years ago, I had this. We moved a lady. Uh, you know, she was retired out of a retirement apartment into a smaller apartment. And at the end of the day, you know, she gave the guys a two dollar tip, and the guys were so grateful because they knew she didn't have much, right? And she gave out of what she didn't have. And that's that's one of those instances that you'll never forget. It sticks in your mind because she gave out of out of out of her lack, right? But um, you know, I've had I've had tips, you know, from all ranges. Uh I'm the type of guy that, you know, now in at my stage of the game, I'm mostly supervising and then wait for Brad to call me to help for the rescue missions, right? So uh a lot of times with us as as the when I get a tip, you know, I disperse it among the crew. And, you know, sometimes it's $20, sometimes it's 50 100 whatever it is, you know. And so, again, it's it's not an obligation, but it's always appreciated. That makes sense. Awesome. Well, thank you. That's so helpful. I think that's a question that always comes up. Do we tip the movers? What are you tipping? Should we feed them? What should we feed them? So yeah, that, I, that's I, really good to hear from you directly. Another sure. another point to that that Ernie and I talked about earlier this morning, just about the lunch, is that make sure that you, if you are going to treat the movers to lunch, you just work with the crew leader and make sure you do it at the right time. Um, Ernie said the worst thing to do is have a great flow going and everybody's really mm -hmm. working hard, and then you take that break for lunch and it kind of destroys destroys the flow of the move. So I just thought I'd throw that out there as well. Yeah. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. So Brad, let's talk a little bit shifting gears from. Um, you know, lunches and tips. <laughs> Can you review the process for scheduling a move for us? Uh, once a service member has concrete orders in hand, what should they do to set up their move? You mentioned last time that it's possible to request a specific moving company. So can you tell us how to do that as well? Right. So if I know that I have talked with PCS grades quite a bit and more and more military members seem to want to do their own PPM move and find their own moving company so they can be in control of the process. Um, I would say that that, well, obviously that's a possibility, but if you want to stack the odds in your favor, 
you can request an individual TSP management company to do your move. So management company, by that I mean charter transportation. We manage about 35 TSPs out there. And there's there's mm-hmm. 7, 8, 9, 10 management companies with different numbers of TSPs that they manage. So you can request a specific management company hand you your move by assuring that your move gets booked on a TSP that that company manages. So it's a very difficult process to explain. So I won't get into a lot of detail on that, but it would be in your best interest if you've moved with, well, maybe you moved with Charter in the past, maybe you moved with a different management company in the past. If you had a great experience with them, try to stack the odds in your favor and re- and get, get back in touch with that same company to have them help you book your move on a TSP that they manage. Maybe it doesn't mean that you're going to have the exact same experience, but you can request it be done. It's somewhat cumbersome, but it's time well spent to make sure that your request is being, that your move can be handled by the same company that provided you a good experience in the past. And as Ernie knows, and I know this, at least within our companies, a a request job is, you know, it's kind of like an honor. So you want to make sure that if they request you do it again, that you go out of your way to make sure that they get that same type of job. So if you want to request charter transportation, you can easily do that. You can get a hold of myself and we can work through that process of working with the PIPSO to make sure that your move is booked on a TSP where I can handle it. Does that really answer cool. your question? Okay. Yeah. And I didn't actually know that you can do that. So that's a really great thing to ask for. And I did want to check how, if I wanted to request charter specifically, how would I go ahead and do that? Uh, we have an email set up. It's request at charter tsp.com. And that will come to myself and my operations manager, as well as my customer service manager. And then we'll be in touch with you to work with you to get your move booked. Um, During non-peak, it's a lot easier to do than during peak. I just had one last week. Actually, it was a customer of of Ernie's contacted me and said, we want to move again with you guys. And I said, okay, when are you moving? They said the end of June. I said, we're going to have to wait to book your move because the traffic distribution list hasn't been published yet for the PIPSOs to book their moves on in June. So I'm always an advocate to tell all members to get their move booked as soon as possible, um, especially if they're not requesting somebody. Get Go mm-hmm. to the PIPSO as soon as you get your orders, get your move booked so that you can start the process of working with your coordinator to develop that move plan based on you know your expectations and, and what you have going on in your life. So doing the request job, We can, at least within our company, if we know we have a move coming up, we'll enter a order into our system and then work with the member to get it booked so that it actually comes to us from the um, from the DOD. So that's kind of how we get around the traffic distribution list issue that we have. And I'm getting into way too many details. I'm going to create a lot of other questions. But (laughs) if you if if you want to know more about that, just feel free to contact me. Absolutely. Well, that is helpful. So. Thank you. And speaking of contacting you, we do want to talk a little bit about communication with the moving company in general, and then with the specific truck and the moving crew and the driver. So uh, we'll ask this to Ernie first, to what extent would you expect to communicate with a military family as the actual driver and the crew that's going to be working in their house that day? And what should they be hearing leading up to those pack and move days or leading up to their delivery day? Well, First of all, you know, it is I can't stress the importance of communicating with your driver crew leader as fast as you possibly can. Uh, coordinators are bombarded. Um, you know, I, I deal with some of the bo- best coordinators in, in the industry, you know, with Charter. And, you know, they get bombarded just, you know, and, you know, I'm dealing with a certain amount of moves for my trader. They're dealing with however many drivers and shipments they're dealing with, right? So, you know, little details here and there, the chances of them slipping through the crack. I mean, it just, it's overwhelming. I know this because I've experienced it. I've been on that side, right? Mm -hmm. So communication as much as possible, especially like start times, you know, um, you know, uh, you want to understand, you know, like myself, if normally I, I, I use the eight to 10 window, but by seven 30, I'm pulling up to your door. Now that changes also 
if you might be my second move of the day, if I'm doing a small one in the morning or, but communication is very key. Communication, both about a uh, destination. Can the truck fit in the neighborhood? You know, is there low trees, low wires, those, you know, things that we should pay attention to drivers should be asking uh, like myself, you know, what, what are the streets like in the morning? Is it crowded? Is there cars parked? You know, just so many things that we have to, and, and then uh, of course, start communicating about delivery. You know, when, what are the dates you're expecting to be there? What are your travel plans? Are you flying? Are you driving? Are you stopping for vacation on the way up there? You know, I mean, but but once you come into communication with your driver, um, with the exception of approvals and things like that, that's where your main communication should be. And the driver, also myself, communicating with my company, with my uh, particular uh, coordinators to let them know what my plans are so that communications are not getting crossed but definitely uh the driver uh is the one that's going to have you know know when his dates are and and understand that those dates could change breakdowns happen traffic you know uh, accidents happen um you know changes happen i may have a shipment on my truck that was estimated at, at a certain amount and all of a sudden it goes maybe two or three four thousand pounds smaller well, now I call, you know, Charter and say, hey, I got room in my truck for another small shipment. What do you have? Well, that's going to cause me to push dates p- potentially on another shipper because now I'm going to stop and pick up another shipment. So there are things that happen in there. So understand, going back to our last conversation, flexibility uh, is important. And uh, But communication, I give my, my members access to my email, access to my text messages and my phone number, and, of course, they have access to uh, our company. Okay. Can I? Yeah, I have a follow up here? for you as well, Brad. You can add oh. to that, but I also wanted to hear from you about, you know, from the company's perspective, what about when a move does go off schedule? How should the family be communicating with you about that? Right. So we'll we'll add on to what Ernie had to say there. So what Ernie was describing, communicating with Ernie is like your perfect scenario. Like you've got Ernie or a type of driver like Ernie. And there's lots of great drivers out there. I mean, we've got quite a few that work for us. Ernie's involved a lot of other drivers that he knows. So when you are fortunate enough to have, you know, a very competent driver assigned to your move, that works great. I will say though, that it is also essential that you communicate with your coordinator just as to what's going on, just in case, you know, the coordinator needs to understand, especially if your shipment's going to storage at destination. So making sure that you coordinate with the with the customer service coordinator is is of utmost importance. And it, it's even more important that that happens when, um, well, our, our industry does a lot of unique things to get through peak season. So we containerize, we put a lot of domestic shipments into crates, and we ship them using less than truckload carriers around the country to, you know, from the origin agent to the destination agent. There, you you can only talk with the coordinator on that to find out what's going on. We also use um, freight companies with what we call no-touch drivers, where we have, a, you know, agreements with uh traditional freight haulers that have you know pads in their in their van and we send them to the house and we we actually instruct the driver not to communicate with the customer and that only Mm -hmm. the customer should communicating with the customer service coordinator on those types of shipments and then unfortunately we've got the dreaded uh, authorized pickup scenario where you know we have a crew to go out and get your items out of the home but we don't necessarily have a hauling solution yet so we're bringing it back to the origin warehouse and we're going to hold it there until we actually secure the hauling solution. So in all of those different types of scenarios, it's very important to communicate with the move coordinator as to what's going on. And hopefully there's proactive communication going on from the coordinator to the member and, and vice versa. And that'll bring you bring us to your question was, what do we do if there is a delay? You know, mm-hmm. again, it's important to just work with the coordinator and it comes down to that whole flexibility thing again. Um, I was involved in a lot of situations last summer, and I'm sure I will be this summer too, where, you know, we were backed up into a corner and that we couldn't do anything. We the, the, Somebody got COVID, somebody got sick, truck broke down, couldn't find a rental truck. And, you know, we just had to figure out how to build flexibility in there after the fact, you know, and obviously we'll pay for an inconvenience claim that it's on us and we'll take care of the members that way. But if there's if there's flexibility in there to you know have an extra day before you have to get on an airplane or have an extra day before you have to leave, I know it's an inconvenience, but 
it, it just helps things go easier when there is a situation, if that flexibility is there. That's super helpful. So Brad, I want to go touch on something uh, a little more controversial in the communication section. So very famously, a few weeks ago, a military spouse posted in the PCS grades group lost during my PCS about how she was tracking her movers move through air tags that she'd put in her shipment and had access to the air tags on her cell phone. Um, the mover wasn't where he said he was going to be, ended up overnighting somewhere residentially. Um, it just didn't go as planned. How do you feel about air tags? What's your policy on that? And what do military families need to know about using that kind of technology? Well, to be honest, when I first heard about the story, I thought, oh, no. But then I sat <laughs> there and I, I, I talked with my customer service manager and my operations manager. And, you know, we all quickly came to the same conclusion that it's not really a big deal for us because we don't we don't intentionally try to hide anything from the customers. So there's we're very transparent with what's going on and we're very upfront. I mean, if you I'll just use the term lie, if you lie to a customer about where their goods are, eventually it's going to catch up to you. You're going to have to pay for it anyway. So it's much easier to say, I know we're late. Don't check out of your hotel because we're not going to be there tomorrow. Stay in your hotel. Don't disrupt your family. We're going to pay for an inconvenience claim. So we're very transparent and upfront with that. Um, we, and we ask for transparency on the other side, too. I mean, if you're going to use an air tag in, in a sentimental item box or something of, of value that you can't take with yourself, that's fine. Just let everybody know that you're doing it. And don't don't try to catch somebody doing something wrong because – you know, like I said on the first webinar that we did last week, you know, throughout all of society, there's good and bad. And, you know, people make bad decisions with everything that we do. So transparency is always appreciated on both sides. I will say if you're going to use a air tag, put it in the parts box. That was one thing that came about when I read this right away. I was like, well, the best thing that members can do is put it in the parts box. And then we should always know where that is. Um, also very important where I, where I do have a little bit of uh, angst, I guess, if you will, with the, with the um, air tags is that there's not enough webinars, not enough information like we're doing today to help educate members on what the process really is for us. So I'm grateful to be here to talk about it, but mm -hmm. we're an irregular route carrier and we have to maximize the space in a 53 foot van. It's not just one box that's getting put into a UPS truck. I mean, like Ernie said, his big shipment went light. He's got room to service another member to grab a shipper's uh, house of goods off of an origin agent's dock and get it to them quicker. So their, their schedules are constantly changing with that. And we had a situation two weeks ago with, with an air pad. Mem member called us and asked why their house of goods was sitting on a trailer or just sitting in one spot in California after they loaded in Las Vegas going to Florida. Well, if you're, if you're not really educated in our industry, that's a fair question. So we explained to the member that the driver, actually after he packed and loaded your shipment on Thursday and Friday, he went to California for the weekend because that's where his next load was on Monday and Tuesday to fill out his trailer going back to Florida. So, you know, we made the RDD, the delivery was on time, but it was just one of those educational things that we need to try to communicate to the military families that, you know, things will change during the process. And, you know, just the location of your shipment is only one piece of the logistical information of what's going on in your move, especially when it gets paired with other people's items. So that's, that's about air tags. I hope that hopefully that answered your questions. Yeah. I, I want to hear Ernie's perspective on it too, though. We had, um, we had some, readers that were saying, you know, this is an Ernie question here. And someone asked, I just lost her, Savara asked um, if we are required to inform the movers about AirTags. So Ernie, do you have an opinion about that? You know, when this came out, like Brad, I read the story. Um, from what I gathered from the story, it wasn't an intentional thing. I think they it got packed up. And from what I understood from the story, they remembered that the AirTag was in the toy box or in, in the box in the kids' room. And then Hey, you know, trying to find their shipment. So, um, you know, in, in our community as drivers, you know, there's going to be people all over the all over the spectrum. You know, some of them are going to say, heck, no, I don't want nobody knowing where I'm going. Some guys are going to be like, hey, I don't have a problem with it, you know, such and such. But, you know, I, I think the main thing is this, you know, we need to uh, 
if if, you, if we're expecting honesty from our drivers, we probably need to expect honest, honesty on the and and just hey, I want to know where my stuff is. You know, um, if you're trying to catch like with me, you're not going to catch me doing anything. If I I'm going to tell you, hey, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go fishing for a couple of days. I'm going to you know, I, I had one over Christmas um, that uh, uh, that we were you know in route, and I said, hey, look, you know, if, if it's okay with you guys. I'm going to go home on my way uh, for Christmas. It's about a couple of miles out of my way, uh, a few hundred miles out of my way, but I'm going to go home. And this is the date, you know, that I'd like to deliver you if it's okay with you guys, you know? So um, I know in our community, you know, the gotcha syndrome uh, or we're going to catch you syndrome is probably not you know, the best, you know, practice. Um, and, um, you know, I would, and I don't know that I won't, maybe I shouldn't open up this can, but if you're skeptical, about whether you're dealing with a solid mover, a, a, a you know, a, a reputable company, then you know maybe that's a, a route you go. But um, you know, uh, again, I just think the gotcha syndrome is pro the the gotcha uh, tactic is probably not the best way, uh, you know, to to handle things. I think that's fair, probably on both sides. But definitely appreciate you guys chiming in on that because I know there's been such a lot of chatter and controversy about that in recent weeks. So it's good to hear. Uh, we're going to shift again and we want to talk about OCONUS moves because we always have questions about people moving overseas. It's obviously a huge common challenge in our community and it's a little bit different from a domestic move. So even if you're somewhat experienced with moving an OCONUS move is a whole different ball game. And I'll admit that during our first move our, that was overseas, we didn't realize that all the furniture would be disassembled and laid flat. We thought that things would just be placed into the truck in a wrapped way. And so we had some cheaper particle board furniture that just completely did not survive getting disassembled and loaded. And it was, you know, completely broken when we got overseas. So how is an overseas move different? How do you pack differently for an OCONUS move? And what are some things that you would want military families to know when they have those overseas orders? So we'll start with your first part of your question. So on an OCONUS move, it's really all about density and how, how tightly can they pack everything into what they're going to do is put them into wooden lift fans. Mm -hmm. And then so that, the more that they can get into those wooden lift fans, the safer your product is. It's not moving around and sailing on the ship. So, and they'll they'll break down as much as possible to make sure that you know they can have it be as dense as possible. So then they'll they'll internationally wrap everything. So instead of using the actual furniture pads, they'll use product like dolphin wrap or paper pads, and then they'll shrink wrap that together, and then they'll place it into the wooden lift fans. The lift fans get sealed. And then they get um, consolidated and loaded into the 40-foot overseas shipping containers. And then, obviously, they go on the boat, sail the destination to the destination port, get unloaded, and then get trucked to a destination agent where then delivery can be scheduled with, with, the, with the military family. So, you know, domestically, we're... We like dense shipments, right, Ernie? We like to make sure that everything is dense. So we will take things apart too, but not to the extent of a international international shipment. Um, I would say that you definitely need to prepare earlier for an OCONUS move simply because you need to really understand working with your coordinator. Uh, and if you can find the personal property consignment guide, which is in Transcom's website, the regulations for what you can ship into the moving into the country you're moving to so every country is different um, some will allow guns you know some absolutely won't um, i'm not an international expert but i know enough to be dangerous i suppose um, most places will never allow you to to send spices or food or any type of beverages you know alcohol is obviously a big one so just make sure that you're in constant communication with your customer service coordinator on your OCONUS move as far as what you can ship and what you need to be prepared for and just making sure you've got all the right paperwork filled out with them. For sure. That is great information. And Ernie, is it any different for you packing up a house OCONUS? Do you have to approach that move differently or have any different conversations with the family? Absolutely. I mean, just some of the points that Brad brought out are very crucial to understand. And the other thing you have to understand is you know, a lot of the breaking down of the furniture 
Uh, density is extremely important because those boxes are going to be moved in ways that are not similar to a trailer. And, you know, any gaps that you have in that load traveling, any, you know, if, if, if one of those doesn't get completely full and get tight packed, the more movement, the more opportunity for damage. And, and um, you know, and especially when it comes to liquids and things like that, I just tell my customers, look, do you like the color of your sofa? And they'll say, yes, of course. I'll say, okay, if you don't want a chance on a big stain on it when you get to the other end, then don't take those liquids, you know, that are, so, it, you know, you're going through different climates, uh, you know, different temperatures, extreme, and, you know, things expand, things shrink. And so yeah, there's so many things that can happen. And so, um, you know, I saw uh, over here on Facebook on the side, somebody mentioned about how do you avoid um, uh, the uh, the mold in the shipment? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, there, there are so many ways. I mean, uh, some people can put uh, coffee, you know, grounds and socks and, and in there, or they can put uh, those things that we get in our shoe boxes, you know, that, you know, find ways to, to eliminate some of that, you know, moisture that's that, that potentially could be in there. Those little silicon packets, that's what you're yeah. talking about. I recently learned that you can purchase them in bulk on Amazon and you can throw them in, like you said, clothing and your dryer and anywhere that you might risk having moisture during a minute. I thought that was brilliant. Now, I would also take pictures, lots of pictures of your furniture, um, especially because when it gets to, by the time you get to destination, you want people to know what it looked like before they took it apart, <laughs> right? That does help. I remember having some conversations with Spanish movers in my very, very minimal Spanish about how to construct my furniture and how tall some of these bookshelves were supposed to be, and things like that. Great. So one of the questions we get the most, I think, especially for our folks who are coming back from Spain and Italy, all over Europe, uh, there's a big purchasing of wine habit overseas. And we know liquids aren't allowed in a in a shipment, but um, isn't there some sort of collection exemption? Brad, can you speak to that? You know, I, there are ways to do it the right way. I don't mm -hmm. know exactly what they are. Um, yeah, I, we actually talked about that yesterday with my international partner who couldn't be on here. And he said, yeah, Italy and Spain, people always wanna ship wine back. And he said, it can be a problem. Um, there are ways to do it correctly. I don't know what they are, but um, I would, so you would just recommend talk with your coordinator to see the coordinator if... beforehand. Okay. Correct. Yep. Perfect. Sorry, I wanted a better have, answer there. On the spot there, I know wine is very important to people. <laughs> we have some of that information on PCS grades, and we have some area guides about moving back from Italy and from Germany specifically. So I just dropped Italy in the comments, but there is a way legally to do a wine shipment, uh, to do a beer shipment, if that's your thing. And it does talk about how the, the rules really depend on what international country you're coming from and what state you're going to, because different states have different regulations. Perfect. There you go. As with anything, if you need more information, visit us on pcsgrades.com. Um, Brad, we've got some time to talk about storage in transit. So SIT is a, always a hot topic. And on our last webinar, you talked to us about what to expect in 2022 with peak PCS season this summer. You warned us it's going to be a very busy season with high quantities and moves. And of course, you always give us great tips about how families can avoid the most congested times. One of the biggest challenges this year will be the storage in transit part of the move. So tell us what military families can do about that. So besides avoiding it altogether, which I know is impossible, <laughs> um, I, I, and I say that we, because last summer when we had the issue, we, we just were not able to find enough capacity out there to accept shipments into the warehouse and then to try to get the destination agent to deliver it to the customer when they wanted it. So I worked with a few members and I, in speaking with them, I realized that they had a home that they could move into, but they were using their leave time in between departing their current station before they got to their uh, new station. And in both of those situations, I explained to them was, which was going to be the worst case scenario that they would probably have to wait up to two weeks to get their items. They mm -hmm. decided to cut their vacation short or fly somebody back to the, or get somebody there to, that could accept it while they were on their leave. And if you can do that, you know, unfortunately I know it's a, it's a, it's a pain and it's an issue for people who are trying to go on vacation in the summertime with their families. But when shipments go into storage, you just, 
double handle the shipment, you increase the risk of claims, and it's very difficult during peak to schedule the delivery because you're competing with the same crews who are out there packing and loading the other members who need to move out. So, you know, that geographically, so Alabama sticks out in my mind. If you're moving to Alabama and need storage, just make sure that you're communicating everything up front with your coordinator and try to avoid it if you can. But Alabama seems to be one of those places where there's not a whole lot of capacity and people need to wait, unfortunately, you know, two weeks, three weeks to get their goods. Now, I know that there's a 10-day rule in the summertime that the TSPs have to abide by, and if we can't deliver the shipment out, we have to pay an inconvenience claim. Um, but just be prepared to, based on where you're moving to. So like Virginia Beach area, there's a lot of capacity in Virginia Beach because it's such a big area. So typically we don't see big problems in Virginia Beach, but like I said, Alabama is often an issue. <clears throat> um, I could put together a bunch of states, but like Savannah, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, <clears throat> some places in Florida, the more remote type of area it is, the higher the tendency is going to be, or the more likely it's going to be to take a while to get your shipment out of storage. Um, when shipments go to storage, you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to protect yourself on that. And one of the key things that we see a lot of times is the parts box. The parts box is missing when it goes out of storage, and now nobody can put the stuff together. <clears throat> so as a TSP, we have to you know, make it right and maybe send third party out that can, you know, put everything together. So I would encourage if there's TSPs or drivers listening to this and if the military members, the number one item on the list should be the parts box on the inventory list. So item number one, parts box, whether it's the packers that started the parts box, it should be number one on their inventory. And when the driver gets there to do the furniture, if there wasn't a parts box that already created, they should make it number one on their inventory. And then when it gets to the warehouse at destination, absolutely assuring the driver should that the parts box was checked off and received at the destination. And I'm just going to continue my thought here and follow it through to the end. And knowing that when it comes off the truck, it's going to be number one on the inventory mm -hmm. and they should be looking for that parts box and making sure it gets checked off appropriately. So Ernie, if you want to elaborate on the parts box at all, I think that's pretty important. Yeah. So as far as documenting it, uh, it's yeah, obviously number one. And then also I put it on the, I, I put it, even if nobody uh, recommend, nobody writes anything on the high value item sheet, I also put it on the high value item sheet. Oh, like and that. so whenever I do, especially if I do storage SIT, I always have uh, the gentleman that's, accepting the shipment initial that he uh, received uh, the parts box, not that it was just checked off, right? And so that way you kind of, you know, your chain of custody uh, because, you know, the worst thing you want to happen uh, is, you know, you can't put beds together, you can't put book beds together because, you know, something didn't make it uh, in the parts box. You know, I started to do something a little extra and uh, that was just to start inventorying you know, each package of, um, of, of hardware. So if I have, you know, the master bedroom and I'll, I'll put a so sticker on that, you know, and, um, you know, especially it, it is a, a very important item for some reason. I mean, if, unless you're just losing the whole parts box, you know, everything should be able to get back to destination so that things can be put back together. I also take the extra step that if I do put, if I take a mirror apart and I put the screws back in the dresser for the mirror, I'll make a note on the inventory saying screws inside the dresser, you know, in the, in the back, you know, so I, I kind of take an extra step because I, I want to avoid those claims on my end of either having to go to home Depot before I sign paper, before I leave to sign paperwork or having to call a charter and say, Hey guys, I lost, uh, you know, some, uh, some hardware. Can you guys get a third party crew out here to fix my problem? Right. And so it's not, and you don't ever, that's not how a good way to end a good move is say, sorry, we couldn't put your master bedroom together. We, we miss, we're missing screws. Uh, so, you know, and, and as I mentioned last time, I think we have, a, I have several members that they do take a lot of stuff apart themselves and keep track of the, um, the hardware. The only problem with that is that if you end up losing hardware, you know, from the parts box or in the room, I have no way of verifying that all the hardware was there unless my crew did it. That does make sense. 
And do you mind if people do take things apart on their own? Is it okay to just put them into baggies and to label those baggies? Or is there a better way to do that? So I don't have a problem and I guarantee you my crew will not have a problem with things already being disassembled, right? Um, um, they'd be grateful because it's less that we have to do. Um, I encourage it, especially when you know that you're going into storage. I do encourage it because you're not going to have the same crew putting it back together. And so, you know, there's always that that element of it. You know, the more that you can prepare to disassemble things, obviously it expedites the move uh, because that's one less thing that we've got to take the time out to do. Uh, but if we, um, so again, it's just, uh, um, it's it's all what you would like to, how much of control you want to be in that hardware, right? That makes sense. I love your attention to detail. I would not have thought of some of those things like the, the screws on the back of the dresser and all that. So thanks for thinking of that. So we don't have to, Ernie. I've got a couple um, other um a couple other things that I didn't mention before that I'd like to just talk about. Sure. If if there's any possibility that you may want an extra delivery at destination and your shipment is going to storage, make sure that those items are separated out for the crew when they're there so that they can inventory it separately. Because if everything goes into the warehouse and it wasn't separated and you need to get your bike out or whatever it was, it is very time consuming and expensive to do so. The same thing goes with any type of important papers that you may need. Um, if you need stuff for closing on your house or what papers, medication, all of that stuff should not go into storage if you if there's any remote chances you're going to need it because doing what we call a storage access means that the warehouse has got to pull down all of the storage containers the vaults that are the house of goods are kept in and then go through every one and try to find that and i've been through too many of those in my lifetime and it's just it's very very difficult and time consuming the other thing again is flexibility don't wait till the last minute to schedule your delivery out of storage give the uh, coordinator as much flexibility and time or notice before you're going to need it. We, we run into a lot of people that call on Monday and they expect to get their stuff on Thursday. And during peak season, that just is not going to happen. So make sure that the more advanced notice we have, the better we can perform. And let's see what else did I have in my notes here. Well, that, that's about it. Okay. So it sounds like you're saying the best choice during peak season is definitely to avoid that long um well it's not that long but that temporary storage period in between a move by essentially doing a door-to-door -door move right that's the only way to avoid that that extra step in the process is by having the same door-to-door -door delivery if it's possible okay yeah the other thing i'd like to just add to that is tell your driver as fast as possible if you know for sure you're gonna need storage because as soon as i get have that phone call with you I'm going to be calling to make sure that they have the capacity to take in my SIT, my storage, because if not, then I have to find another location. Uh, like Brad said, there are certain areas in the country that, you know, if they black out, you know, I've got to know this as quick as possible to be able so that we can make those changes um, because it's going to affect whatever as a driver, it's going to affect you know what if if they book me on a date for another move and i'm thinking okay i'm going to deliver on the 9th i'm loading again on the 10th and all of a sudden there's no sit availability then then it, it it's going to affect everybody right sure mm -hmm. yeah and i guess i never really realized that the the storage was another variable in the process it's not a consistent location that you're always just dropping everything at the same place so that it can just be a whole other wrench in the wheels there no, I but, get frustrated just trying to get my Christmas decorations out of my own shed. I can't even imagine <laughs> trying to get a bike out of storage when you've got all of these competing moving families. So thank you for that perspective. That's really, really important. For sure. Brad, I think I have one more question I can squeeze in for you. And we know that more and more families are going to be doing PPMs, personally procured moves, um, also known as Diddy moves just because of the high tempo of the upcoming season. And that's fine. And we have lots of tips and lots of ways that people can maximize their use of a Diddy move. But you said that you had some kind of inside perspective and caution that you wanted to throw to families that are doing a PPM. So they're not using the official military movers, but they might be considering hiring moving companies to help with part of the process, either the loading or the transport. And what words of wisdom do you have to keep everyone on the straight and narrow if they're doing that route? 
Right. So I, I, I read an article uh, this weekend, actually, and it was what we call a rogue mover. And they're just very unscrupulous business people, if you want to call them that. But they're really out there and they just they basically steal from people. They mm. give them one estimate of seven thousand dollars and then it ends up costing them twelve thousand dollars. So we and they hold their shipment hostage until they pay the additional money. So the industry terms them rogue movers. And with the status of the market and how many people are moving themselves now, more and more of these rogue movers are popping up. And it's very easy to go online and type in all your information and do a virtual survey and get a quote within two hours. I mean, everybody today wants everything as fast as they can get it. (laughs) And so they get this quote within two hours. The quote looks good. They book their move. They pay for it with the credit card. And then the company that you booked your move with takes your move and gives it to another moving company. Mm -hmm. And then you're at that mercy of that other moving company. So you have to be very careful with who you're working with. And I would just make sure that you're, you're doing your homework with the company that you have. And there's tools with the um, American Trucking Association of the International Association of Movers, which I think you may have some links to here Mm -hmm. that will help identify uh, reputable movers that are parts of their organization. And, don't just go with somebody that gives you a quote simply online. Make sure you do your due diligence with them. Hopefully they're a local moving company and you could actually drive past their place and see that they actually have trucks and assets out there that are going to service your move and not just be a, a, a what we call a brokered move. Um, I actually tried to do this one time three years ago. I just wanted to see what it was like. So I went onto one of these websites, did the whole quote, had it moving to my mom's house in Wisconsin. And I said, are you sure on the quote? And they're like, yeah, we're positive. This is exactly what it's going to cost you. I said, well, I don't think you can get a truck into my destination location. And they're like, no, no, we can, we can. Well, I know that they can't. So <laughs> it, it's just one of those things where you, you just set yourself up to have to pay for more money in the future. And that's why I know Transcom and the services want you know, they push the DPS system because at least the the rules are there. Although it's not perfect, the rules are built to protect the military members when they move through the DPS system. So I just wanted to bring that up as a warning to say, hey, if you're moving yourself, watch out for these rogue movers and do what you can to protect yourself. That makes sense. And it is it is such useful information. I know we've chatted before about how there isn't just, you know, one secure location where you can check out the entire moving industry. But you mentioned the IAM website, the International Association of Movers. We've had them on the webinar before as guests, and they've talked about a resource that they're developing to showcase, at least in their network of their approved companies. You can look up who's licensed, um, you know, who, who's a reputable mover. And if they're not in that database or on that list, then it doesn't mean you can't use them. But it just means, like you're saying, do your research and um, go into it with your eyes open, I guess. All right. If I could throw something in real quick, you know, remember that if your movers show up to your house and you, you know, you, you're doing one of these moves where you've been, and you don't like the way they're acting, the way that they don't look professional, they're not acting professional. It may cause you a big headache to postpone your move and get another mover, but call it off, you know, save your, save the other level of headache of, having to worry about your stuff and, and, you know, have getting into legal issues, you know, you can refuse them uh, to come in and serve at your house. If you're not happy with, with the way that their presentation is. That makes sense. And Brad, would that be a, something to bring up with your move coordinator? If you're having those type of issues? Oh, not if you're using, not if you're well, Yeah, I'm, I'm referencing uh, rogue movers, right? You're right. Or, you know, so. I see. Right. I see a strong demand for Ernie in our future. (laughs) I do. I need Ernie to like coach me through my next move and then come do my whole house for me. (laughs) Well, I think it's, but I think if there's one thing that we've learned in having you guys two times now, it's that there are great movers out there. There are people who, you know, want to have transparency from the company side, who want the accountability, who are willing to go above and beyond. So thank you for setting the bar for all military movers that, um, it actually can go well that there are good moves out there. Right. Don't forget, like I said before, I mean, you can request that some individual does your move. So, you know, get a hold of, it doesn't, I'm not, 
I'm doing this to help <laughs> members. I'm not plugging charter transportation here, but if you moved with any other TSP management company before and you had a great experience, do what you can to request them because request jobs mean a ton to the companies that are doing them. So. Awesome. That is so good to know. Well, Tessa, are we ready to give out some prizes through our wheel of names? It's my Hello. favorite part of the show. It's also the Today most for the got some stress less PCS kits. Mm -hmm. Surf All right. Here we go. This is always my favorite part. Um, I love giving my prizes. It's also the most stressful of making sure I share my screen correctly. So share here we go. Screen. <laughs> All right, we did it. Are we ready? Yeah, we're gonna give out three. So go ahead and spin for our first winner. Our first winner is. Dun dun dun. Oh, it might. So far. Hey, all right, winner number two. Marissa. There's the family programs. <laughs> and our winner number three of the Stress Less PCS kit is. Steve. <laughs> All right. Steve, who was very helpful in sharing resources throughout the webinar as well. So thank you for participating. Um, if everyone would please message the PCS Grades Facebook page to coordinate getting your prize. Um, that way we can get it to you. And thank you all. Gentlemen, you guys are the best. You are. Oh, thank We're you so for glad you're us. able to come back. Hey, if you have a problem getting Steve his stuff, I'll take it for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we should just send you one. I think we can probably make that. <laughs> so as always, uh, we want to give a shout out to our, our scouts. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Lizanne? Yes, we have spouse sponsors at numerous locations around the country, and a lot of them are watching right now. So I want to give a special shout out to those of you who are a spouse sponsor through PCS Grades. And we're looking to hire more at new locations. These are people that you can chat with and connect with when you get orders to a new location. They can give you all the local info, tell you what to look for, answer your questions, and just be a helpful resource when you get there. So if you are looking to be a spouse sponsor at San Diego, the Pacific Northwest, Fort Hood, Maxwell Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, then please message our page like I said, we are hiring for those positions and looking for spouses at those locations. So we'd love our, to hear from you. Our spouse sponsors are truly amazing, as are our guests every week for our webinar. We so appreciate you coming back and enduring the many questions that we have for you about everything from air tags to your favorite meals. Thank you for being here. And thank you to our audience for watching today. You guys are fantastic. If there's anything we didn't answer, you can always leave it in the comments and we'll try to address it on a future webinar. There's also a plethora of resources on our blog. So make sure to visit the PCS Grades blog. And Lizanne, do you want to tell them about our webinar next week? Yes. Next week, we are shifting gears a little bit. Still talking about moves, of course. But this is from the perspective of families with special needs, particularly EFMP children. And so we're going to have our friends from Partners in Promise talking about the results of the Family Lifestyle Survey, what you need to know as a family with EFMP or any kind of special needs, and all those details for a PCS move. So until next week, I will see you then. And remember this too, Shell PCS. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.